Jesus willing and hope. Those take that next step. We do not know even about the spiritual climate of this paralytic's spiritual life any more than we know about anyone else that was gathered inside that house that day. But we do know that everyone was there because they wanted a closer relationship with God. They were spiritually hungry for food that really satisfies, that nourishes the soul. And the only one way one finds out more about God is by being around someone who has been with God. When these four friends were met with the adversity of a crowd that they were not able to get their friend clearly through to before Jesus, they were resolute in finding a way to get their friend before Jesus. That old phrase, where there's a will, there's a way, certainly proved true for these four friends in this paralytic. They walked around the back of the house and lifted him up towards the roof. The roof was a, a flat roof, a veranda type, made of sticks and twigs that had been cemented together by clay. By listening to Jesus' voice, they were able to determine where Jesus was when he was speaking to the crowd, and they proceeded to take away one branch and one twig after another. And as they stood there, Jesus looked up. Debris was falling from the ceiling mud and dirt and twigs. And suddenly the light from the sun shone into the room and was getting larger. And then this man is lowered carefully down in the blanket before Jesus' feet. The scripture doesn't say that there was any conversation that was exchanged between this individual and Jesus. Jesus knew what the problem was because he always does in our lives, whether we tell him or not. Scripture merely says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the prayer paralytic, your son, your sins are forgiven. Their faith was apparent by the demonstration of what links they would go to bring their friend to Jesus. There was no immediate rising from the mat. There was only a period of silence until there was a disturbance in the back of conversation between the scribes who realized that some boundaries of religious protocol had been crossed. He said in their minds and in their hearts, and then they said it aloud. Who can forgive sins but God alone? It is blasphemy. Jesus, mindful of their thoughts and their words, just as he is with our thoughts and our hearts, Their thoughts were based upon Jesus surpassing his authority, his authority to forgive sin. How can he forgive sin? The questions of their hearts were becoming public and agitated in conversation. Jesus spoke to that conundrum in their hearts. But they were stuck. You see, their thought patterns were not able to take the next rational step. God alone can forgive sins. Jesus said this man's sins are forgiven. Therefore, Jesus must be fill in the blank. They couldn't fill in the blank. If 
A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. I still do a little bit of that uh, mathematical calculation of the wonder years. <laughs> But they would not allow their minds to go there. Jesus would not be limited by their limitations. He revealed that neither outcome nor his authority was limited by specific words. Neither would he mimic the phrases to shore up the rigor mortis of tradition gone wrong. For Jesus, it did not matter whether he said, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, take up your mat, and walk. It was the same. His authority was the same. The outcome of this man that was in front of him was what was most important. It would not be lost. His attention would not be lost on massaging wounded religious egos. He told the man to stand up, take up his mat, and walk, go home. And so he did. This event did not occur in isolation. Those who witnessed this miracle told others about it and the one who brought it about. They were amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Never. Others would think about the obstacles or impediments they were facing in their lives, both then and we today, now in our lives, and ask themselves, do I have the faith to bring this matter to Jesus? There's a song that I learned when I was in high school which began with the words, Jesus is a way maker. He is that and more a way maker when we surrender our hearts to him and follow him. His words are recorded in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How about you? Is there something in your life that you are confronting that simply refuses to move? It may be a situation that only you know about. Have you brought it to Jesus? By bringing whatever it is, you are also bringing yourself to Jesus. He is waiting for you to express that in your heart right now to him. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden or overburdened, and I will give you rest. The biblical understanding of that word burden is something that means that it's beyond our ability to carry. It just gets heavier and heavier and heavier when we try to carry it by ourselves until we decide to do something about it. Or you may have a friend in such a plight who needs to be coaxed and carried to the feet of Jesus. God may be speaking to you about that friend. Are you willing, and if necessary, to get three other friends, how many friends you need, to help your friend as he or she have never been helped before? I just finished reading a book, same kind of different as me, which describes how God used a couple in Fort Worth, Texas to embrace a homeless person they were white and he was black. And how God worked through their three lives in such a way that they all, each one, became more whole. Sometimes the prisms of our categories are too small. This is a true story of how God's love changes us on both sides, through and through. And he still does when we allow others to be our friends and when we're friends to others. <laughs>